Uh, I was working on Good Day, starting to drink more than I should. By the time I got to Roseville, I knew that I shouldn't be driving. I pulled over and suddenly whoosh, my car was illuminated. Oh, Roseville PD. I'm not now, nor have I ever been a, a very confident person. And I wish I would have had someone or something giving me some strength and confidence. Skied all the way into a, a, the, the parking lot and ran into a Winnebago. Oh. Compound fracture of my leg, half body cast. When you're all in the same room, aiming towards doing something good. There's a healing. I pitched the idea, what if I do my show for a month living 24 hours a day on a highway billboard. This is the first time I ever have to retake an intro. That's awesome though, because it's short attention span theater and no one can remember it. Taking it from yeah. the top? Yeah. All right. You got this. Welcome back everybody to another episode of the Vibe with Humanity podcast, a show intended on spreading positivity and kindness. I'm your host, Trevor. Today's guest is Mark S. Allen. Mark is a seven-time Emmy-winning TV and movie producer. He is from West Texas, where he started in radio and transitioned to television on shows like Comedy Central Short Attention Span Theater and Mark at the Movies. Mark worked for 20 years on Good Day Sacramento as an entertainment anchor and a film critic where he became a household name. He is currently on ABC 10, and he is a feature film producer with eight major films under his belt, including the acclaimed Apparition and Notorious Nick. He is quite the entrepreneur with ownership stakes in several companies, including Smart Axe, where you literally drink alcohol and throw axes. Well, I no technically, <laughs> I don't drink the alcohol, <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'll throw the axes. <laughs> I have no idea how you get insurance for that in 2024, but it's a lot of fun and I'm very impressed. So Mark, this is round two. Hey, the last time one of us did, did the mute button or something. So I'm really glad you're here. I'm happy to hear from you today. Let me tell you how nice this guy is. I think I said, I may have pushed the mute button and you probably knew I pushed the mute button. <laughs> and you said, oh, I don't know about that. It's yeah. not on you. No. It's absolutely me. I'm sorry. <laughs> How old were you when you first knew you had an inclination towards some sort of entertaining? Obviously, the puppets are, you know, a sign that, hey, maybe I, I want to put on a show. But when did it go from that to, I think it's radio or I think it's TV? What did that look like? Well, I mean, and like at an early age, and again, it doesn't make you popular. You're in a football town. Hey, I'm a ventriloquist. <laughs> That's uh, right. Yeah, great. My, my dad, I, later my dad was proud, but let me say he was very troubled early on. Yeah, son, are you are you ever going to sign up for the baseball team? <laughs> I'll get around to it after I finish this sock puppet, Pa. So did you ever perform as a ventriloquist? Yeah, and, and the way that came about, I was skiing with my family. I was six years old, skiing with my family for the very first time. And they put me on the top of a slope and pointed me down at the bottom and I had forgotten how to stop. And I skied and I was terrified of falling. And I think you snowplow at that age to, to stop. Uh -huh. And I didn't do that and just kept going and skied all the way into a, a, the, the parking lot and ran into a Winnebago. Oh. Compound fracture of my leg, half body cast um, oh and couldn't do any of the PE activities. So they shoved me in a library every day. And I read a book on ventriloquism, and that's how I learned how to do it. Wow. And so, I mean, there aren't many things that I can tell you that I do well in life, but I'm a great ventriloquist. So how long were you in radio? And then I want, I want to hear the story of transitioning to television, and we're mm -hmm. going to title it Break a Leg Kid. <laughs> Seriously, that's how it happened. I was working radio, and in, for lack of talent, I would always create these stunts to draw attention to the show. And also try to use the signal to help raise money for charity. Mm -hmm. And muscular dystrophy became a, a big charity that I was involved with because I, I had a friend that had muscular dystrophy. And so I pitched the idea, what if I do my show for a month, living 24 hours a day on a highway billboard? And they said, if you'll do it, let's do it. So I'm living there 24 hours a day, three days into it. Um, about two o'clock in the morning, I, there's a horn honking and drunken yells, hey! Are you really up there? And I came out from this tent. I had a tiny little two foot tent that I would sl slide out of like onto this plank, <laughs> kind of. And there was a two foot, yeah, exactly. It was like base camp, and there, like a little two foot plank that extended from the uh, billboard. And I would stand on that and lower a bucket. And they said, We want to make a donation. So I'd lower this bucket down. And I lowered it down, and these guys yanked on the bucket while I had the other end, and it flipped me off the billboard. I did a flip oh. and landed on my feet, 30 feet below the concrete. I was wearing high-top Jordans at the time. That may have helped me. I broke my leg, broke eight bones and two feet, had a concussion, broke a rib, 
cracked my shoulder. They felt bad. And uh, a now defunct high school called Encina, its football team happened to be driving by. Not the whole team, but just some guys that were out for the night. Um, drove by and saw me and felt bad. And so they kind of did a team up the ladder to help drag me back up the ladder. So I said, you guys, I have to be up there. I'll get fired because I was supposed to be wearing a safety harness and I'm, I'm sure I'll be in trouble. So they put me back on the billboard. The next day, our program director, uh, promotions director, Mike Rogers came by. He could tell something was wrong. I told him. So they, they were going to pull the plug. The American River Fire Department came over, which is now Sac Metro Fire, lifted me off the billboard, took me to the hospital, got me all put back together. And I said, Doc, is there any reason why I can't go finish this stunt out? And he said, no, just take your medication to ward off the pain. As long as you're safety harnessed in, I think you would be okay doing that. So they all agreed to it as long as that harness never came off. So they put me back on the billboard, That's harnessed insane. me back up. And I sat there, and it was a slow news week, and so every TV station in town would come out, every newscast, to check on the guy that fell off the billboard. The biggest news station in town and a legendary anchor, Stan Atkinson, broke the news, and that's like the shot heard around the world. Everybody knows about it then. And when Stan said something, then AP News picked it up, and then all of a sudden the networks start picking it up. And I was live on CBS Evening News, this guy that fell off a billboard and went back up, and Matt Chan, the creator of that show Scratch, saw it, and called me the moment I got down off the billboard to complete the stunt and said, hey, have you ever thought about going into TV? Do you do anything on the radio that would translate? And I used to do a radio feature called Dateless and Desperate, and he thought that would make a great segment on TV. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing Dateless and Desperate wow. on a TV show called Scratch that was local for about a year and then became national. About that time, I got invited to go to the set of a James Bond movie in, <laughs> yeah, in, in, in London. So I, I want to hear the story. <laughs> The, the, the James Bond movie? You almost killed him. I <laughs> did. I almost killed one of the Bonds. It, um, it would have been Pierce Brosnan, so it's not like we were going to lose Daniel Craig. Uh, <laughs> could have been worse. No, I like Pierce Brosnan. Love uh, Pierce. But, but I went to do the stunt, and I was late to set, and so the escort they had sent me that was going to walk me into Pinewood Studios on the set um, wasn't there. And I just kind of, I don't know if, it, if I just walked with an air of confidence like I was supposed to be there, but nobody stopped me at all. Um, and so I'm wandering around the set, wandering around the set, and I, I'm just kind of lost, and I see departments running around doing something, and so I thought, I should probably call them and let them know I'm here. So I pick my phone out and go to hit button, and right before I hit send, I'm blindside tackled sideways. They practically kick the phone away from me like it's a gun. It turns out we were surrounded by all these pyrotechnics that were about to go off for this big flyover sequence, and I could have and likely would have set them off by the cellular frequency that I was using. Things are infinitely more protected and encrypted now, but back then it was just an open oh, yeah. signal that would have like done Crashing damage. airplanes and blowing up James yeah, Bond. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. When you talk about opportunities and taking advantage of like things that, that could end your life or, or at least end life yeah. as you know it, uh, I was working on Good Day and was starting to drink more than I should. My mom had just passed away, and I'm not using that as an excuse, but it's certainly something that was running in the background. And every week I would host charity events. And keep in mind these charities, a lot of times it's their year-end event. And as they should, they're going big, and they're letting their hair down, and, and maybe they're, they're drinking more than they typically do, and you know it's cause for celebration. Why not? The problem is I'm hosting these things sometimes twice a week, and when in Rome, I'm there going big with them. Oh, yeah. But it's not my event. It's not my one time when I know not only do I have to be up at 4 a.m. tomorrow morning, but then also I have another charity gig tomorrow night. I just started drinking more at these events I see. And then one fateful night, I was at a Christmas party charity event at Memorial Auditorium, and I had too much to drink and left. And I, by the time I got to Roseville, I knew that I shouldn't be driving I pulled over in old Roseville, was looking for my cell phone to, to see if I could find the cable to charge it so that I could get a Lyft or Uber. And suddenly, whoosh, my car was illu illuminated almost like uh, extraterrestrials were about to <laughs> like, extract me. And I realized, oh, Roseville PD. Oh, no. So this is how it's going to go down. And uh, fully cooperated with my arresting officer and was arrested. And the, the TV station, CBS at the time, um, put me on suspension till further notice, and they just kept pushing the suspension, and the uh, the courts threw the book at me, as they should have. 
I shouldn't have been driving, and mm-hmm. I was way over the limit. Not that even a little bit over the limit's justified. But I, I was, I, I'm grateful they threw the book at me because it really made me take a look at myself yeah. and change the way I was living. I stopped drinking for some time at that mm-hmm. time and uh, just knew that I was going to have to make life adjustments at that point and mm-hmm. really take ownership in what I was doing, what I'd become. Uh, can I ask you, how did you... Did you? How did you quit drinking, and did you have to modify your lifestyle at all to support a non-drinking lifestyle? What did the process look like to go from "Wow, I have a drinking problem" to "I don't drink anymore"? Yeah, I I don't want to act like I I know it all because I don't, and that's when you really get into trouble. Um, they threw the book at me, and I, I'm grateful for that. Because of that, I had to go to both AA classes and then also uh, uh, counseling, mm. in-house counseling for some time. Um, followed up with just weekly meetings. Um, not a just weekly um, counseling meetings about it, and through a combination of all of that, I just you know started to get tools and and not have a problem with it. I will say like I haven't had the usual triggers where you can't walk into a bar or you can't be around alcohol. None of that has seemed to be a trigger for me. And keep in mind, I wasn't a daily drinker. I didn't just I didn't have to keep a blood alcohol content. I wasn't an alcohol addict, as it were. Um, I just had events where I would tend to go big and bigger. And so I just would go to these events knowing there was going to be alcohol around, knowing that it wasn't an option for me to have alcohol. And it worked. I blinked an eye and had crossed the five-year mark yeah. without incident. Yeah, you had sufficient motivation to where you're just you're That's just the other thing. Whenever you know, you're know you forced into having an, uh, an officer or two stare at you while you're peeing into a urinal... That level of humiliation <laughs> yeah. will tell you never again will I do anything that puts me in a situation where I have to do this. And I have bashful bladder to begin with. On a good day, <laughs> I can't use the bathroom in a public stall. Yeah. Like I have to wait till everybody's out of the bathroom or find a, an enclosed stall before there's a chance of me being able to use the bathroom. And so now I'm in a court-ordered situation where they're taking blood, blood. I mean, uh, urine samples. Uh, at a moment's notice, like I drink Diet Coke without ice. One time I was drinking a Diet Coke at Top Golf, and someone saw me, I think, and called the probation officer because they knew something was up. Yeah. I got a call and she said, We want to see you immediately. So I had to leave Top Golf. I went to my probation officer. They demanded a, a urine sample immediately. Wait, from someone me. like called to tell on you, like thinking you were drinking or something? I think so. Yeah, I mean, wow. she, she okay. all but told me, but couldn't tell me that someone had called in that I was back on the bottle. It was a Diet Coke with no ice. But because of my bashful bladder, I stayed there for like these poor <laughs> officers. I stayed there for like five hours. They would like, I'd drink some water and I would try nothing. She goes, okay, go sit down. We'll try it again in a half hour. Every half hour, they'd pull me back. And then finally, I was able to feed just enough for them to test. And it came back clean. Um, <laughs> but yeah, th- that humiliation, I will never forget it. I never want to be back there and I deserved every bit of it. You mentioned manifesting. Do you practice uh, visualization or, or think about law of attraction or manifesting any of those techniques? Is that something that you've put purpose behind? I believe in it wholeheartedly. I should do it more yet at the same time, there's a part of me that, that wonders if you if you really ask for it, if you're trying to manufacture what you want in your head, I wonder sometimes, does it work as well? But if you genuinely just want something or thinking about something organically, I then like I think it comes true. Like that whole Comedy Central thing, just it blows me away that I told her I wanted that show and two weeks later, they reached out to her for wow. Comedy Central. Wow. Do you, do you set goals at all? Do you? How do you go about attacking new chapters in your life and... Yeah, I mean, I, I said daily goals of what I want, want to accomplish on this day, and then like a five-year plan, a 10-year plan. I always have a project going, a myriad of project-specific goals. Like if I'm editing a film, I want to have a rough cut done on this date, and I, I make sure that that happens. Have you ever wanted to quit in your career? Like, did, it, did it, something ever happen where you're like, I can't do this anymore, I'm bowing out, or hey, it's not working? Did you hit a stall point, and did you have to push through that and keep like anything yeah, like that? I never wanted to quit at Comedy Central, but like I would be the first to say I was the wrong guy for that job mm. and was met with scorn from a lot of different departments. And that's not good for you on a daily basis. And I never wanted to quit. I wanted it to get easier, but I never wanted to quit. Um, outside of that, I've been fortunate to just to have a joyful time with every endeavor, every day. Um, but I had this one boss 
that just came out of nowhere, that came from a really evil place. And I wanted to, there was a time where I did want to quit. I thought, yeah, I think, I think it's time to hang the hat up and walk away. How did you get through that? Grit? Uh, yeah, I, I think just grit. And uh, one of my favorite movies is Castaway. And I don't know anyone that's, who says that's their favorite movie. Uh, that's my top three. Oh, seriously? The Forrest Gump, Castaway, uh, yes, 100%. Sorry, well, continue. When he's debriefing with his buddy and he goes, I just, I just waited every day to see what the tide would bring in because I knew it would bring in something to help me. So that's my theory in life. When I'm at my worst, I go, let's just wait and see what the tide brings in tomorrow. If you could give your younger self life advice or life advice that you wish you would have had earlier, what, what would that be? Um, find your inner confidence. Because I'm, I'm mm. not now, nor have I ever been a, a very confident person. And I wish I would have found that inner confidence. I think there are a lot of cultures and religions that are really good uh, across the board. Um, but especially like early on, religions were very quick to uh, to shore up young men and prepare them for adulthood and give them strength and confidence. And I think religions across the board now, um, like they're accessible and they're they're religions are making sure that young women are equally empowered and ready to go as they should be. But for me, I didn't have anything like that backing me as a kid. And I wish I would have had someone or something giving me some strength and confidence. How did you find that? I mean, I'm still like, I I get like a trembly voice, like I'm 13 again, if I have to cold call some big studio executive. And I wish I had a little bit more confidence. Did you Um, just push through it and fake it till you make it? And yeah, just fake it. That's awesome. It. I, I can tell you if I if I'm on camera doing my job or behind the camera directing something in the moment, I have absolute confidence. Like I know what I'm doing. But then put me in a, a board meeting or in an office or in a one on one meeting or an interview type situation or even an audition, no confidence at all, which isn't good for this industry. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's awesome to know that someone with your success and accolades is still feeling that, and you just push through it, guys. There's success. no, yeah, this definitely. Success. Kevin Johnson, the mayor, they had a birthday roast where people just got up and roasted me. The mayor of Sacramento said, um, he goes, you know, my staff wrote a speech where they said that the city of Sacramento is lucky to have Mark S. Allen. I think Mark S. Allen is lucky to have the city of Sacramento because where else could someone have a mediocre career last so long? (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. And he nailed it. He landed it perfectly. (laughs) People fell out of their seat. Do you have any spiritual beliefs or practices these days? We talked about manifesting. You mentioned that religion can give people that confidence. Do you have any sort of belief in a higher power of religion? Absolutely. I I think religion and spirituality are, are key. To everything we do. I just think it would be so lonely not to think that there was a loving God taking care of us. How do you practice that? Do you pray? M- it, meditate? Yeah, church? Yeah, I, I, I pray and, and meditate frequently. I should go to church more often. Um, the thing about me is that I've never met a church I didn't like. And I there was a time where I was very specific and bound and determined to find a church home. So I was trying many different churches on for size and loved them all, got something out of each and every one of them. The problem is because I migrate so much, and typically on, on weekends, I'm either in New York or L.A., um, so it's hard for me to find a, a church here. Yeah. And when I do have that off chance where I am home-based, then I'm trying a new church on for size again, yeah. which is probably why I hopped around so much. Well, you're, I don't think you're missing anything necessarily. I think the, one of the points of that is to teach people how to act and live and treat each other. And you're very kind and gracious and generous with your time. Well, so you too. And, think, and when you're in a, a church, what do they say? Like, um, it's like pizza. Like even an, an average pizza is still <laughs> really good because it's pizza. <laughs> yeah. Well, what can go wrong? So I believe when kind people and like-minded people, when you're all in the same room, Aiming towards doing something good. Mm, there's a healing. Just, there's energy. a healing. It's there's a good a magic. feeling. Well, I feel that here today, and I guarantee that got pushed out to the audience. So thank you for coming on again and being vulnerable. And anything else you'd like to share or want no, to talk about? Before? Like, I didn't want this to be a commercial. So I'm not here to tell people to watch Amy's Effort List <laughs> yeah. on Prime Video. Amy. <laughs> it's, it's now free. Just try to try to Google Amy's bucket list and see what happens. <laughs> right. Cannes Film Festival, winner. Long after the camera shut down last time, I told you how great you are and what a gift you Thank are. Thank you. And what a gift all of that you're doing here is going to be. So keep having people 
The only reason I'm here is to pitch other people to be on your show. Oh. So keep getting these great voices on your I show. I will. Thank you for the help. Peace, brother. Right on, man. Thank you.